Shalom from Jerusalem. Um, I'll take a few seconds to make sure that I'm live on Facebook. I know the connection is pretty weak and um, I'm trying my best. Um, but um, it seems like I am live. So again, Shalom and good evening from Jerusalem. Um, I'm Amir Tsarfati and I'm reporting uh, from Jerusalem right opposite to the uh, walls of the old city. It's nighttime, you can't see much. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I, um, I wasn't uh, doing well um, for the past uh, 24 hours. I probably got dehydrated and um, I was in bed for nearly two days, but um, thank God I'm back on my feet. I feel much better now and thank you for all the prayers. Um, I, I'm not going to do it too long today, really, because um, there's only th about three, four things that we want to talk about today. But um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about uh, will, will, will be about the um, very soon visit of uh, President Trump to, uh, to Jerusalem. And then we're going to talk more about the uh, French elections, uh, the um, slamming of Erdogan um, on Israel and the Jerusalem uh, presence of Jews in Jerusalem. And we'll talk in a few minutes also about uh, things that are happening in Syria uh, right now. But before we do that, why don't we start this with a prayer. So Father, we thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to not only look at the things that are happening around us, but also to look into your word and to understand the times and the seasons in which we live. Father, we are not interested in, in fables. And we're not interested in stories. We're not interested in human opinions. We're interested in, in your word and your plan. And we are uh, your children. And you promise that you uh, declare the end from the beginning. And that's exactly what we want to, to behold with our very eyes. Father, we ask that you will uh, control the technical aspect of this broadcast today and that you will bless the hearts of people across the globe uh, from uh, the west coast of America all the way through Europe um, and through the Asian countries all the way to Australia. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies and we thank you for your love and kindness. We ask all of this in the matchless and the most beautiful name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray, and God's people say, Amen. So, um, first thing I wanted to say is that... Uh, um, we are expecting, Israel is on full gear, less than two weeks from now, we're going to have a presidential visit. Um, a, uh, Donald Trump, together with his family, as well as um, a large delegation of nearly 1,000 people, they're all coming um, to Israel, and first thing they're going to do from the airport, they're going to be flown directly to the city to visit the Wailing Wall. From the Wailing Wall, they will go to visit the Holocaust Memorial for about 30, 40 minutes, continue to the President's house and the Prime Minister, and the next day, President Trump is going to give a speech from Masada. Uh, from there, he will continue to the Palestinian Authority, to the city of Bethlehem, and from Israel, he will continue to Rome, to the Vatican. Um, I don't want to get into the the my opinion about visiting Saudi, Israel, I mean, Mecca, uh, and, and then visiting um, Jerusalem and then Rome. But I will tell you uh, something that probably you may hear for the first time. I think I said that before, but it is official now. President Trump had decided not to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. 
Um, and, and, and let me explain why before you, you get a little bit um, unhappy with it. Um, he's not going to do anything different than um, presidents that were there before him. Uh, in fact, um, the entire um, plan to move the American embassy to Jerusalem uh, started already in a bill, in a law that was passed by the U.S. Congress um, in, uh, on October 23, 1995. So starting from 95, a law, a bill was passed. It was called the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. And ever since, there was a clause in that law that allowed a presidential waiver. And the presidential waiver, uh, the, the, it says that um, the constitutional question was apparent while the legislation was working its way through both chambers. And it's they, basically what they did is that they allow the president, beginning October 1st, 1998, the president may suspend the limitation set forth in Section 3B for a period of six months uh, if he determines and reports to Congress in advance that such suspension is necessary to protect the national security interests of the United States. And, uh, and basically what happened since then, President Clinton... President George Bush and President Obama all together 11, to the best of my knowledge, 11 or 12 times, they uh, signed that waiver. Every six months, a U.S. president is basically vetoing that law and extending that veto for six months. The last one was obviously signed by Obama shortly um, before shortly after the elections, the six months period will come to an end on May 31st. And for President Trump, this is May right now, he had to announce, he had to, to, to tell people what, what he's about to do. Now, I told you before here that even Benjamin Netanyahu wasn't entirely supportive of the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem at this point, no, obviously all the Israelis want that. But you have to understand timing sometimes is extremely important. Right now, we are trying to restart the whole peace process. Not that I have any uh, illusions. I know it's not going to happen. I know it's a waste of time. But at least the world that demands that Israel will sit and negotiate with the Palestinians, we, we told the world, look, it's not working. Um, obviously, to start with the Palestinians and then then move to have peace with the rest of the Arab world didn't work so far. How about start with the Arab world and that will lead into peace with the Palestinians. And so the the visit of Benjamin Netanyahu to the White House a couple months, three months ago, uh, basically um, what happened is that um, he floated this whole idea of regional peace and uh, Saudi and the United Emirates and Qatar and all of them they are at least Saudi they, they're supposed to be the main um, partner for a regional peace with what we call the moderate Sunni Islamic countries around us so um, obviously President Trump was pressed by the Saudis as well as the other Gulf countries. Um, and he basically, they told him, you know, you can't ask us to sit around the table with Israelis and talk peace when you take such a unilateral step and announce that the third uh, holiest city to, for the Muslims around the world is Israeli, it's the capital of the Jewish people, and that's it. Um, you know, that cannot happen. So President Trump most likely is about to tell Congress that he is signing the waiver for six more months. Um, I think that what the, um, what the Prime Minister of Israel is trying to do right now is at least to 
tell Trump, don't announce it, don't tell anyone about it until you're the end of this visit. Let's not, let's not have that visit to Jerusalem um, be under the shadow of or, or the, 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 the cloud of your decision not to move the embassy. So right now, everybody's trying not to talk about it. But I said that before, the Jerusalem issue of the moving of the embassy is the sacrifice that had to be sacrificed for the sake of regional peace, or at least an attempt for a regional peace here. Um, President Trump is not coming just to visit. He's, he's coming to try to, to initiate a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We're expecting a a meeting between Abbas, Netanyahu, and Trump in Jerusalem. Um, Abbas understands the map, and he won't say no to such a meeting. Um, Netanyahu understands, you know, obviously I cannot say no for a sitting president in the White House, certainly such a, a friendly one. And so something is going to happen. I'm not sure what, but I do know that Jerusalem was just sacrificed as far as the embassy moving to Jerusalem, it's not on the table anymore, at least not for the next six months. So this is, these are, I don't know, breaking news or whatever it is, but, but I know that uh, a lot of people were expecting Trump to do that. He cannot do that. He cannot fly to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and come to Jerusalem and, and, and continue to the Vatican in bring the news that he's moving the embassy to Jerusalem. By the way, both Riyadh and the Vatican would not be happy about that, each from his own religious reasons. Um, so we talked about that. Um, yesterday, the White House declared that it is going openly to support the Kurdish front or the Kurdish rebels in northern Syria and finally, someone decided to openly come out of the closet and say, yes, we need to help them and we need to support them. The only good guys in this whole story are the Kurds. And if anyone is fighting ISIS on the ground, it's not the Russians, it's not the Iranians, it's not the Turks, it's not the Syrian army, it is the Kurds. So <laughs> let me make it very, very clear. If you want to help fighting ISIS, you must help the Kurds. And guess who didn't like that? Of course, Turkey. And guess what the White House said? We don't care. We are committed to fight ISIS and we will help the Kurds. Of course, what we're going to do is supply the Kurds with, with ammunition and weapons that can fight ISIS, not Turkey. But you must understand that the Turks are way more against the Kurds than against ISIS. I think I mentioned that more than once, that Turkey is doing business with ISIS. Turkey is buying oil for half price from ISIS and selling it for full price and making a lot of money on, on the way. Turkey is basically having a revolving door, allowing recruiters to come to, um, to uh, recruits to come into Syria from their territory. And so Turkey is, is turning a blind eye to the growth and the expansion of ISIS. ISIS is, by the way, losing ground right now. And the biggest fear right now is that so many of the ISIS volunteers who came from America, Canada, but mostly Europe, are now going to go back to Europe, America, and Canada, and they will, um, they will execute their plans over there. So President Trump, already is doing things that his predecessors didn't. And he's openly vowing uh, to equip the Kurds with enough uh, weapons uh, uh, to fight ISIS. And this, these are good news. Now we're going to come to the um, uh, French elections. But before we do that, let me say a couple words about pre the Turkish president Erdogan. Um, first of all, Erdogan, a couple days ago, I think yesterday or two days ago, I'm sorry, I was so sick, I don't even remember. I think it was two days ago. It was the Al-Quds Day, the Jerusalem Day for the, for, for the Muslims in Turkey. And he, from the stage, openly said, I'm calling all Muslims from all over the world to come and take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem 
I don't think they need to take over. I mean, it's already in their control. What's the point? But then he said, I'm ashamed that Israel is controlling Jerusalem and we need to fight the Judaizing Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem should be Muslim and the fact that Jews are in Jerusalem is wrong. Erdogan is anti-Semite. Erdogan is Holocaust denier. Erdogan is not about peace. He is a fundamental radical Islamic leader. He won the elections mostly because it was all corrupted. He is throwing half of his country to jail right now um, for not standing with him. He is violating every possible human right. He is not loved by the West. He is not loved by the Europeans. He is not loved by the Israelis. He is not loved by the Russians. He is not loved by anyone, but he, he's probably in love by, by himself. And I cannot understand how so many people that I, at least I read comments and talkbacks, can even entertain the thought that Erdogan could be the Antichrist. Let me explain to you guys what the Antichrist is all about. The Antichrist is a man of peace. He introduces himself as a man of peace. He is going to bring peace to the Middle East. He is going to be loved by the liberals, by the world, by even the Jews. I mean, can you imagine? These are three and a half years of what I call a trial, a testing time for Israel. And again, that this is going to be the time where they will look at that person who will eventually rule the world in the latter part of those seven years, and they will worship him. They will fall in love with him. He will be their world leader. Guys, you have to understand, there is nothing in Rajib type Erdogan that any Israeli, any Jew, or any European or Westerner to, be, to, to talk, you know, even in his own country, there's nothing in him that anybody likes. And the fact that he's uh, strong, it's because, you know, he, he, it's, a, it's a big economy and it's a big uh, military. And he's now the ruler. And he, of course, uh, he's not rising from a democracy. He already changed it. Uh, it's no longer a democracy. Rajib Tayyip Erdogan is not the Antichrist. Not that I claim to know who the Antichrist is, but I can tell you who is not. It's certainly not him. I need you to just remove that from, from your thoughts. Jews will not choose a radical Muslim who hates them to be their Messiah. And the last thing he wants is the Jews to be in Jerusalem. He's openly vowing to, to kick the Jews out, and he's openly vowing for Muslims to take over the Temple Mount. How in the world can someone like that allow the Jews to build a temple on the Temple Mount? And, 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 and somehow introduce peace to this region. It is ridiculous. It is absurd. And I'm telling you, he should be off your list. Now, I will also tell you this. Yes, we're going to talk in a few seconds about Macron and about the French elections. But if anything, if you want to look for someone who could be what the Antichrist is going to look like, you know, because, you know, John, in 1 John chapter 3, we talked about, he talked about how there are already antichrists that came out of us. And he's talking about the one, but he says there will come, you know, before some other ones. What we see in Macron's case is a 100% match to what the Bible gives us as far as the characteristics of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has to be someone that the world is amazed by, someone that the world falls in love with, someone who, who is romantically uh, uh, taken by the world, someone who is a man of moderation and peace, uh, someone who is uh, loved by all religions, Someone who is in love by all sexual inclinations. Someone who is in love by, by uh, 
countries across the globe, no matter what culture they are. You, you, need, to, you need to see the coverage of the French elections to understand that Hollywood is about to jump on the opportunity to, to already produce a movie about this guy. Now, the scary thing about him is, is that he came out of nowhere. This is a 39-year-old guy that, um, if I may say, um, rose to power in ways that are almost, it's hard to explain. You, you understand he was born in December of 1977. He went to very elite schools. One of them was the École Nationale d'Administration. Uh, this is the um, most uh, prestige school for pol politicians, uh, kids, and, and the, the new generation of politicians. He worked as an inspector of finances just for a you know, couple years. Then uh, he worked for a, about two years only, a, an investment banker at the Rothschild Bank. Two years, and he made more than three, nearly $3 million in two years. The rise to power is too fast, too smooth, and it's too predicted. And then became a member of the Socialist Party from 2006 to 2009, and immediately appointed as Deputy Secretary General under François Hollande. And then 2016, after... In two, okay, now, in 2012, he was appointed as the Minister of Economy industry and digital affairs in 2014 actually you know one of the things that characterizes or will characterize the era of the antichrist is the the way he's controlling the world financially and he has to be someone who understand in finances who understand how the market works this guy um, you know it talks about economy, industry, and digital affairs. Of course, he, he, he resigned in August 2016 when he launched the campaign to run for president. Now, let's make it very, very, very clear. I am not saying he's the Antichrist. I am saying this is the type of what the Antichrist is going to look like. Whether it's him or not. I don't know. And, and I will tell you another thing. I don't really care. Believe it or not, we the believers shouldn't deal so much with who the Antichrist is, and we should deal more with who Christ is. Our identity is in Christ. Our future is in Christ. Our being is in Christ. It's not that the Antichrist should even dictate anything about who we are and what we do. I do agree that if we're not taken in the rapture from some strange reason, we, we were not taken because we probably were not ready, then the Antichrist identity is truly an important thing for us. But, you know, one of the reasons John was talking about the Antichrist is to prepare us is to give us an understanding when he wrote 1 John. And you have to understand, yes, we speak maybe about the spirit of the Antichrist. But look what the Bible says in, in 1 John chapter 4. It says, By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist is already in this world. It produces leaders just like this one. And then, of course, the Bible says in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he um, that restrains will do so until he is removed. And then that man of sin, the son of... It's funny, only John 
in 1 John only once used the term the Antichrist. All the rest of the times, that person is named in, in different names. He's named the son of perdition, the man of sin, sin. Daniel talks about beasts. Revelations talked about beasts. Um, but um, the term Antichrist is in John only, in 1 John. And it's interesting because um, that person is none of our business. Literally, it's none of our business. But his spirit is our business because his spirit is already here. And, and it's interesting because uh, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, it says, watch this. It says, it says this regarding the spirit of the Antichrist. And it says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he, than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world. And the world listen to them. We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, I know that so many of us can be very frustrated that the world doesn't see what we can see, and the world doesn't understand what we understand. And, uh, um, but do um, you understand something? There is blindness. The spirit of the Antichrist is in this world. And it's been like that for the last 2,000 years, by the way. Whenever John wrote it, it was already there. It is the last hour. And so his spirit is here. And you can, we can characterize the spirit of the Antichrist in many, many ways. Um, but bottom line is, it does not recognize Christ as Lord. This is it. The bottom line is, anyone that does not um, confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is uh, not from God, you know, and that He is Lord. He's He's the Messiah, and He came in the flesh. And 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 any any spirit, the Bible says, uh, that um, that uh, does not confess that Jesus, not confess Jesus, is not from God. It's very simple. So, you know, you, you can see how those young, very very, uh, I don't know attractive to the eyes of the world, those leaders, their biggest problem are the Christians. Their biggest problem is the Bible. Their biggest or oh, the largest fans that they can find are amongst those who do not agree with the Bible, who do not accept Jesus as Lord. So we, we, have, to, we have to remember that, you know, God opens the eyes of his children if they ask for it, you know. And, and once we are from God, we, we can see that spirit. And when we sense that spirit, we, we stay away from it. But again, I, I'm telling you, I don't think that this whole dealing with who the Antichrist is, 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 is healthy for the body of Christ. We need to detect the spirit of the Antichrist, which is already in the world, and we need to stay away from it, and we need to warn people from it. Who the Antichrist is, is not for us. Why? Because obviously we're not going to be here to witness his rise to power. So, yeah, I thought you said that Macron might be the Antichrist. No, I said this is much more what the Antichrist is going to look like than Erdogan. Again, for those of you who really have this fantasy that Erdogan might be the Antichrist, kiss that thought goodbye. He's everything the Antichrist cannot and will not be. Um, I'm not sure if it's, <laughs> if it's a compliment for him because, you know, when, when we tell someone, you know, you know, this guy is not the Antichrist, it's a good thing. But in his case, it's not a good thing. Turkey, you know, right now is led by a Holocaust denier, uh, you know, a very 
a Jew hater, a, 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 you know, an anti-Semite, and eventually he's going to be defeated um, on the mountains of Israel. Um, and of course, some people are telling me, uh, some people are telling me, um, Amir, um, we believe that the Antichrist has to be Muslim because look, he's going to behead people. Well, beheading people is not reserved to Muslims only. Beheading people was, in the ancient times, a way to kill people and, and is now, every time it's adopted by other people, and uh, it, it doesn't mean it's Muslim at all. And um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just trying to cause you to think, you know, the fact that, you know, he's uh, in Turkey doesn't mean he's the Antichrist. Um, so... This is it, guys. We, we, we talked about what's going on. We talked about, uh, about what's going on in Turkey, in Syria, by the way. It's funny, on May 4th, Russia, Turkey, and Iran signed a deal to reduce violence in, 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 in Syria. Isn't it? It's fascinating. You know, we're reading Ezekiel, and these are the countries that the Bible talks about that will come against Israel. And they, they are already together signing a deal to somehow reduce violence in, in, in Syria. But remember, Syria is just a playground for all of these people. And eventually, Israel will become the target. So there's the playground there is, you know, that which appears to them as the reason. And later on, of course, Israel will become the target. They will be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. God is not done with Israel. Israel is God's people. They are the apple of his eyes. Uh, of his eye. And, and it's interesting because as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are there, Israel will be there. You know, there's no point of resisting that. There's really no point. You're, you're only making yourself miserable. Um, it's interesting because uh, the world, I believe, is given to so many lies. And one of the biggest deceptions of the history of the world regarding Israel is this entire Palestinian lie. And I just posted on, my, on the Behold Israel Facebook page... An amazing interview that was given in the 70s uh, with our late uh, Prime Minister Golda Meir. And you must listen to the words that were said by a, a very liberal, by the way, uh, political leader um, who was from the Labour Party, not from the Likud Party. And she, was, um, she, was, she grew up in America, in, in Milwaukee. She moved to Israel in 1921. She grew up in a, one of the kibbutzes in Israel. And believe it or not, from 21 to 48, she held, like all Jews, a Palestinian passport. She was a Palestinian as well. The whole idea that Pal the Palestinians are Arabs and there's Israelis and Palestinians is wrong to begin with. There's Jews and Arabs. That's it. The term Palestinians was a term that referred to a specific name of a specific portion of land. That's it. Everyone who lived there were called Palestinians. And, and it's interesting. Nobody talked about, nobody underwrote the Palestinian rights until Israel came into the picture. Uh, you know, between 1948 and 1967, nobody talked about a, a Palestinian state. Israel did not have it. Israel did not have the West Bank. Israel did not have you know, Gaza Strip, and nobody talked about it. Ever since Israel took over, now this is the problem of the whole world. Um, it is obvious that it's all political. It's very much deception. It's from the prince of this world. It's the attempt of the enemy to bring about hatred to about you know towards Israel. The lies continue to spread. And if you know the truth, the, only the truth will set you free. Only the truth can set you free. Um, there's another interesting interview that uh, uh, was done by a Palestinian person uh, just about two weeks ago, Bassem Eid. 
He's a Palestinian born in Jericho. And he was interviewed. Um, and uh, it's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm probably going to post it on the Facebook also so you, you can hear what a Palestinian person is saying about this whole situation. Um, believe it or not, the Palestinian uh, leadership is is supporting Assad with all that he's doing to his own people, and, uh, and what and the people, the number of people he killed in five six years is probably I don't know hundred times more than anything that was ever done to the Palestinians by the Israelis within. I don't know, 50 years. So when you're blind, you're blind. And when you choose to believe the lie, it's your choice. Um, but again, only the truth can set people free. I want to encourage all of you to continue and listen to, you know, or, or read the word of God and just let the news confirm what you already know. Don't ever lean on the media only. Uh, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to also lean on conspiracy news websites. I think that one of the reasons we are so violent in the way we talk to each other in recent months is because we are given to all of those conspiracy alternative screaming websites and it it has gotten to such a level that that Christians are no longer known for the love of each other. The Bible says in, in the same First John chapter four, it says, um, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God, and known and knows God, and the one who does not love." does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God had sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might be through him, we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So, um, I just hope that we take heed of those words. That's the message we need to send the world, that God sent His only begotten Son, and He whosoever believes in Him will not perish but will have eternal life. He whosoever believes in him will not have to deal with the Antichrist, will not have to worry who the Antichrist is, will not have to worry about those things that the Antichrist might be doing. He has to love the people of God and together do the work of God, of spreading the word of God to this very, very dying world all around us. It is so shameful that we bully each other, that we hate each other, that we attack each other every day on, online. For what? What do we gain from it? Um, so having said that, I, I just want to conclude this Facebook Live uh, Remember, continue to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. I'm on Behold Israel, one word, Instagram. Um, if you are not subscribed to our newsletter, just go to beholdisrael.org, add your name and address, and we're going to send you every week the news of the whole week. Um, I would like to thank you for listening to what I had to say this evening from Jerusalem. And if possible, I would like to remind you um, to pray for your family, for your children, for your, um, for your siblings. Every day, proclaim that you and your household 
will serve the, the, the Lord. And this is a terrible, terrible time that we live in. The spirit of the Antichrist is all over. We must hold on to the truth. And the spirit and the bride say, come. We invite you, Lord, to come back. We can only invite him to come back if we are ready. So, having said that, I hope that you will take things seriously and get ready for him to come back and take you to be with him forever. Um, thank you for always telling me that you're a watchman. You're a watchman from this country or from that country. It's so important that you proclaim every time that you are a watchman. A watchman is a person who is called by God to look and see the times and the seasons, to understand what's going on, and he has a task to warn the people. Now, you, you can't save people. You can just warn them. If they choose to ignore your warning, it's their problem. But if you fail to warn them, it is also your problem. So may we understand the very significance of the task to be a watchman. And um, we need to remember that. So if you're not a watchman, become one. Be a watchman. Now, some people wrote me and said, not everyone should be a watchman. Um, it's, it, it's a high calling. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not a high calling for some people. If you know, you know something terrible is about to come, what are you looking for? For someone else to warn? And if he's not around, you think you can get out of it just because you don't think it's your calling? This is baloney. Everyone who knows the truth knows that only the truth can set people free. And every one of us is called to be a priest. Every one of us is called to be, um, um, you know, holy priesthood. You know, we have been chosen. We are chosen people. We are priestly nation. And with that comes the responsibility. And one of the responsibilities is not only to live holy life, and not only to dedicate our life to the Lord, but also to be a watchman. So, you know, whether it's to communities around you, to friends, to family, to work members, you know, and don't think, by the way, that you only need to talk to other believers. We need to talk to the rest of the world. You know, if Jesus would have come now, uh, I wonder how much time he would spend with the believers and how much time he would spend with the non-believers. Uh, you know, we... You know, we need to remember that and we need to go out and, and to that world and, and really tell them the truth. And the truth can only be, tell, be told with love. You know, I remember I spoke in a conference in Minnesota and, and somebody approached my table and he had a, a T-shirt and it says on him, accept Christ or die, something like that. Um, or no, or go to hell. And I was looking at him and I said, I do believe that you have to accept Christ. And I do believe in hell. But to come to a person and instead of talking to him about the love of God and about the price that was paid for him and about you know, the, the, how the truth can be uh, set him free, to immediately bring this whole hell card. And this is, I believe, wrong. You know, we need to tell the message of God. And the message of God is, is, of course, the price that was paid because he had loved us so much. And then, of course, when people understand how much God loved them, even before they loved him, that is a much better way to, to get to their hearts. So we thank the Lord for his word, for his promises, and for our soon gathering to be with him. Um, one of the characteristics of this, the end times and the soon return of Christ to take us 
is the falling away of the church, is the falling away of believers, is, is the apostasia, the apostasy. And um, I just uh, saw, uh, probably two hours ago, somebody sent me, uh, Louis Farrakhan uh, spoke to Christian, a Christian audience um, uh, six months ago. And then he said, um, he started praising Jesus. And then he said, wait a minute, probably you're thinking, why am I praising Jesus when I'm a Muslim? And then he said, well, because Jesus was a Muslim. And I was like, (laughs) and then he said, Jesus never said he's a Christian. And everybody were clapping and hooraying. and, And I was thinking to myself, how illiterate, and ignorant people can be when they think that God has a religion and that it, and if anything, he never mentioned that he's a Christian, so probably he's a Muslim. When, when, when you're a Christ, you cannot be a Christian. You are the Christ. Christian is the follower of Christ. But beyond that, To think that Jesus is a member of a religion that came only 600 years later is beyond my comprehension. And to think that hundreds of Christians were sitting in the audience clapping, it just caused me to realize how far those who call themselves followers of Christ, believers in Christ, have gone in the what I call apostasia, the falling away. And, uh, and how many of those false prophets are coming from within? So, having said that, we know we have all the signs of the end. And we need to remember to lift up our heads and look up, because indeed, our redemption is drawing near. Why don't we finish with a prayer? I would like once again, as always, to pray the ironic blessing upon you and your families. And um, I want you to remember, for a Jew, this is a very intimate prayer. That's the prayer we pray over our children. Um, But for a Jew, I believe it's I I think it's a calling also to pray this over those who have been grafted in and now are partakers of the fatness of the oil. I believe there is power not only in the word of of God, but in in that which God asked to pray over his children. So without further ado, if you can just stretch forward your hands to receive, um, I would like to pray that Aaronic blessing upon you. So... Again, it is from um, it is from Numbers chapter six, verses twenty four to twenty six, um, and it is that which Aaron was commanded to bless the children of Israel. So let me bless you, the Aaronic blessing in the Hebrew language. Yevarechecha Adonai v'ishmerecha. Yaer Adonai panavelecha v'ichuneka. Isa Adonai Panavelecha Vyasem Lecha Shalom Shalom Peace The Lord bless you and keep you and He uh, lift up His face um, and be gracious to you. He will lift up His countenance and give you peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that peace is the peace given by the Prince of Peace. So um, I thank God for all of you. I praise you. Uh, I praise God for, for who uh, He is and for the children that He, uh, he has all around the world. Um, I love you from Jerusalem, and God bless you. And uh, just last thing, if you haven't done that, um, again, we do have that raffle. If you want to win an Israel tour with me next year, you can go online to our website and see um, you can purchase the Israel Unveiled um, Volume 2 and get to that list. I think within probably the end of this month, if I'm not mistaken, on May 31st, I think, 
this is the day we're going to announce the winner. So thank you. I love you. God bless you from Jerusalem. Bye-bye.